If you turn in your Bibles to Luke's biography of Jesus, we're going to be looking at chapter 1, verse 57. And you may have that on your phone or, or in your regular Bible, but Luke chapter 1, verse 57. Luke is compiling the story of all stories, and he, want us, he wants us to be certain about salvation. As I read, I wonder if you will notice that three times the idea of salvation comes up. Start with me in verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered, and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke, blessing God, and fear came on all the neighbors and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, blessed be the Lord. God of Israel, for he's visited and redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Would you pray with me? Father, this story is familiar to many, and yet we ask individually that you would speak to us today by your spirit. Would you, Lord, please reveal where we need to hear Good news. Father, some of us today are bored. Others are bright with hope. Some people here, though, are, are kind of burned out and just need to know that salvation is real. Please take these words from your Holy Scripture off the page and move them into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the title today, if you're a note taker and you want to follow along, is spiritual extrication. Spiritual extrication. Extrication is a unique word, which means how do I get released from a tangled, stuck situation? It's a very specific word. Or to look at the other way, how can you experience life larger, fuller, and more engaged? Salvation, uh, did you notice it was brought up at least three times? Salvation means to deliver a person who is stuck in a confining crisis into a spacious clearing, free from limitations. If you're not a Christian, we're honored that you are here today. Uh, some of you have looked at the Christian narrative, like Luke was encouraging his friend Theophilus to do, and as you looked at the Christian narrative where you meet Christians, you would say salvation, in your mind, leads to a narrowness, a rigidness. People that don't really look like they are very forgiving. If we have come across like that to you, I would ask you to forgive us. This is not our story. 
Our story, which we just read a portion of, is about salvation. Larger, fuller, more engaged. All of us probably have a work situation that feels tightening, uh, difficult. Maybe a financial pressure, a relationship, physical suffering. We want to be extricated, saved from that difficulty. But the most important thing that is brought up here in the story is extrication from spiritual suffering. We are trapped by drives and desires which are not right. They're beneath our dignity as human beings made in the image of God. Do you want extrication? Do you want that? Extrication is the most common desire I have experienced as a nurse over the last 27 years. Why? Why not some other desire from a suffering human being? Well, because most of those years were in the emergency department. Maybe you've spent some time there after an auto accident. I would hear people say this to me when I would ask them, how are you doing? They would say the scariest part of being a patient in the emergency department was not showing up here, but it was when I was pinned inside my vehicle and powerless to get out. Maybe you've had an experience where you've been in that kind of an accident. I remember when I was early in my ER career, a 20-year-old man got a job driving an 18-wheeler in the mountains. It had flipped over, and I'll never forget him telling me I waited hours upside down, pinned into a truck, and as I spoke to that man, it just dawned on me, we as human beings don't like to be stuck. We desire extrication. My greatest emotional trauma, which has given me panic attacks, and before this happened, I never had panic attacks. I could look at anything in an ER, came when I experienced the desperation of extrication, watching others that could not get out, and I could not help them. My family will probably remember I was driving our van with our five kids in the van and I saw a car on the highway veer off and go into a grove of trees and I heard a loud noise. I knew from my ER background that I needed to go help. And I was pretty confident that I could. I ran up to the car, but the car looked as though it had been crushed by one of those car crushers at one of these uh, automobile scrapyards. The horn was stuck and it was, it was blaring in kind of an eerie way. And as I walked up to this crushed car, all I saw was a hand out of the window and a faint crying. I thought, I'm gonna get these people out. And I yanked on the door, but the, the, the vehicle was so crushed, I couldn't open the door. I could not extricate these two ladies inside. I just held the lady's hand. And as I look back on it, I think why I kind of get panicky is I was out of control. I wasn't in my ER. I didn't have my medicines. I didn't have things that could help. I sat there and it felt like forever, just holding her hand and saying, I'm here, but it felt like worthless. She wanted to be extricated, the two ladies. All of a sudden, the EMT crew showed up with the firefighters. And you've seen these before, but it's called the Jaws of Life. This hydraulic tool came out, and it's, I stepped aside and watched that tool rip off that door. And two ladies were pulled free. Extrication. Salvation. The trapped, the confined are set free. It's used three times here so we don't miss it, miss it. And in the Old Testament, it's a word, yasha, used over and over. That which is constrained or cramped becomes spacious. Here's the good news today. You can experience spiritual extrication because of three things. God's favor, God's savior, and a rich metaphor the sunrise of God. The sunrise is when it's so dark, but all of a sudden even the darkness must open up to brightness. Let's look at the first one here. You can experience spiritual extrication because of God's favor. 
the opening scene of the story. A baby boy is finally born to these old people, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Word's going to get around this small town. The angel predicts that when everybody got together on this glorious day, there would be rejoicing, and there was. When an angel predicts what's going to happen, it's going to happen. The custom back then was that the eighth day, the eighth day, the friends and the family would come together for a circumcision and a naming ceremony. Why? Why would the father circumcise the little boy and give the name? Well, if you know the whole story, the whole narrative that's compiled by God, Abraham and Sarah, two old Old Testament believers in the coming of Christ, were given new names in Genesis 17. And with the arrival of their new names, they were given the sign of circumcision. The eighth day. Eight is a number in Scripture of new beginnings. We have the seven days of creation, and then you have that eighth day. Think of you as musicians. The story of the scripture is everything is whole, but then in sin we fall away, we wander away from home. But then we come back to home and there's wholeness again. In music, you have eight notes in an octave. If you stopped on the seventh note, you would have a lot of tension. You're going away from the beginning. It's the eighth note that finally says, ah, all is satisfied. All is full. The eighth day, it was a number for new beginnings. It was a number about creation. It was a number, like the birth of a baby, of new possibilities. Circumcision was a key sign, though. It was a covenant sign that God gave on the eighth day. God loves to give signs to seal his promises. The sign related to a relationship between a man and a woman. This is circumcision, all right? Kind of awkward. We're talking about something that we normally don't talk about, but... If you want a real relationship to bear fruit between a man and a woman, be fruitful and multiply. We're talking now about a promise of fruit, circumcision. Leviticus 19 has an interesting command. If you were an Israelite, God said, when you go into the promised land, you cannot even eat the fruit from a tree for three years. And it labeled the tree uncircumcised, unfruitful. See, in the story of God... Since only death could flow through Adam, and Adam was full of sin, that generative organ was considered dirty, was considered unclean. Rebellion against God meant that everyone born of Adam was born in sin. And God gave a sign and said, cut away on that generative organ, that sinful flesh. See, dirty means at some point you were clean. Dirty means now you feel guilty. You're not living up to the expectations of when you were clean. And God is saying, I promise on the eighth day of a boy's life, he will belong to my family and you will cut away the sinful flesh on the generative organ because I promise I am sending someone who is clean. I am sending someone who will save. And you must mark your child as mine. It's the only way to enter the covenant community. Signs and symbols shape and sustain the entire narrative of Scripture. They're all over. And if you're not a Christian again, or you have a friend who's not a Christian, there are signs that God puts all over his world to let you know that something bigger is going on. When they showed up to the naming and circumcision ceremony, something bigger was going on than just cutting off the foreskin of a little boy. Think about as you look around today, why is there a human propensity for freedom? Why would none of you want to be stuck in a vehicle and you enjoy the experience of extrication? That's a sign that something bigger is going on. Why is there a pervasiveness of human play? Why do we enjoy playing? Why do we enjoy music and beauty? Why is it that Christians and non-Christians, if you just played the seven notes in an octave and you didn't play the eighth, Everyone would say, that does not feel complete. That's a sign. Humans demand, here's another sign, not just condemnation for bad, but damnation. The dirty must be removed. The custom was that the sign would occur and the dad would give his boy a name. But you'd usually give your boy your own name. And that didn't happen at this time. 
Elizabeth breaks into the story and says, listen, everybody, I know the dad names him, but we're naming the boy John. God loves to change our names. Naming anything is an assertion of authority. Abram, which meant father, I'm going to rename you Abraham. You are going to be the father of nations. Sarai, you're a princess, but I'm going to rename you. You will be the princess of nations. When God names, we are always on the threshold of a seismic shift in his story of grace. John, what does that name mean? Do you know? Favored one. Favored by God. What does favor mean? What bobs to the surface of your mind when I say the word favor? Do me a favor, my wife will say to me. She's got the honeydew list. She wants me to do acts of kindness. Do me a favor. Or have you ever gone to a wedding or a party and you get a wedding favor? It's free. It's a little keepsake. It's something given to you that you did not earn where they said, I really like the fact that you were part of our gathering. Favor is the inclination to give approval to another person. It's to see a person as attractive, beautiful, charming. Elizabeth barges in. His name's going to be Favored. Favorite. You prefer and you promote this individual over another. I'm a nurse manager. I'm not supposed to pr practice favoritism. I'm not supposed to advantage or benefit someone. His name is John. His name will be favored one because the Lord has shown favor. And this is amazing. Imagine being Elizabeth. Imagine being uh, Zechariah. Imagine being John growing up in the wilderness as it says in the end. God's love is not based on you. It's placed on you. The difference is good news. The people insisted, because traditions at a, such a significant ceremony where the circumcision would happen, traditions are strong in a culture. They said, this doesn't make any sense. It goes against our customs. It's outside of our expectations. You can't do this. Yes, when God begins his extrication of trapped sinners, there will be signs of decisive discontinuity with the spiritual status quo. They turn to Zechariah. They make signs to him. Which means he couldn't, he didn't only have the problem to speak, but he also could not hear for nine months because he did not believe that God would give such favor. Look at verse 63. He asks for a writing tablet, and he writes, His name is favored. They all wonder, What would you do? Luke was a doctor. I love the fact that he uses a unique word for the writing tablet. In the Greek culture at that time, the prescription pad, he used that term. Luke the doctor says, the dad says, give me the prescription pad. Let me tell you what God has prescribed. This boy's name will be favor. Jokanan in Hebrew. By the way, if I've lost you, focus in. When did Zechariah get his hearing and speech back? Was it, uh, was it at the birth of the baby? It says in Scripture, immediately his mouth and tongue were extricated, untangled. Asked another way, did he get his speech back at the birth of this baby? Was it a day or two after the baby was born? No. Only after he responded to God's direction with faith. His name is John. He wrote that down. He echoed what God had already said. Maybe an application for you. Howard, I, I don't change hardly at all. 
I feel so stuck in the same addictive patterns, the same problems with work, the same issues with my spouse, the same issues with my grandkids. Why don't I change? I cannot extricate myself. I wonder if God has asked you to be obedient, to actually follow what he tells you to do. John, uh, Zechariah had to wait nine months to finally write down what God had directed him to do. The first word out of his mouth when he finally was able to speak was, bless God. In Latin, it's called the Benedictus. It's the first word that he said. He does not say, I'm so glad I got a kid who's now circumcised and part of the family of God, and there's hope that someone will come to save. He is excited about God. He blesses God. He will bless his son, John, but first he blesses God. Bless means to make larger, fuller, richer. Curse in their culture was to make smaller, and the worst curse you could have was to hang someone on a tree where you would shrink their dignity, and they would have shame publicly. He says, bless God. Let's enlarge the beauty of God with what God has done. How do you experience spiritual extrication? Receive the free favor of God in Christ. It is a blessing. John's identity is pure favor. And do you remember what Jesus said about you and me in relation to John, favored one? In Matthew 11, 11, Jesus says, there's no greater man born of a woman than John. Was John greater than Moses? Yes. Was John greater than Abraham and David? Yes. But then Jesus says something absolutely audacious. In that same chapter, he says, if you're the least in the kingdom of heaven, you're greater than John. I look around this room. I don't know if you're a Christian. But if you are a Christian, and you wonder if you matter, if you have significance, or if you're in a fight with another Christian, and you've torn their beauty down, their status down, Jesus, and to be a learner of Jesus means we have to, like Zechariah, actually believe and live according to his direction. Let me say Jesus' words again. The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than the favored one. What would that do if you believe that? You are God's favorite. That good news is better than the jaws of life for those two ladies that were set free on my most traumatic day. Secondly, you can experience spiritual extrication because of God's Savior. Favor is a concept, but Savior is a person. Look at verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has visited. He has visited. Visited. It's used in the Old Testament exclusively for judgment. But in the New Testament, it's used exclusively for the tender mercy of God. Visited. It's two times in this story. It's the Greek word episkopos. It means to look over intently. I have a son who's a supervisor in the hospital. He looks over intently the work of another. It says here, blessed be the Lord God. He has come and he has looked intently on his people. He doesn't just see you in your need. He feels for you in your need. And he comes to you when you are hurting. God is entering your story in person. He entered history in person. What's your motivation, God, for visiting us when we're a sinful people? To accomplish redemption. Redemption, it's this extrication work again. It means to release you from bondage. It goes back to the story where two million Jews were stuck in Egypt. They needed to be extricated, and they could not. Before the Red Sea would part, the people had to pay the price of the death of an innocent lamb. They would have to take a lamb, an innocent substitute. That lamb would have to die. They would have to paint their door that narrowing area that will release them out into an opening with the blood of another. They would extricate themselves out of the house of bondage, but it would be coming at the price of a substitute. We need extrication from slavery. Slavery to sin 
and its consequences. The consequences of sin are terrible. Guilt, shame, the worst is death. We are not free. We are not free to fix our relationship to God. We're not free to bring a beautiful God and a blameworthy sinner together. Look, if you fall out of an airplane, and I hope you don't, you will need extrication unless you have a parachute. But let's argue you don't. You may feel that pulling hard on your sleeve will make you secure during your descent. But you are not secure. Extrication demands a Savior. Look at verse 69. God raised up a horn of salvation in the house of the servant David. Horn? Let's open up that metaphor because we need to let it breathe. Not a car horn, the horn of a mighty ox or bull. A horn's going to extricate us, God? How will a horn save us? I love, and it's probably because most of my career has been ER, I love this book called The Worst Case Survivor's Handbook. Have you heard of it or read it? They will tell you what to do if you're stuck in a giraffe stampede. Just in case you are, and I love giraffes, and I want to go on safari someday, you can do something, this book says. Giraffes don't like water. So just jump into a body of water. Or what if you are being attacked by a bear? Their chapter is very short here. Simply outrun your friend. But the one that they say in this book, which is interesting, it goes back to the horn, is if you are in a stampede of bulls, they admit even in this book you've got a problem. Because if you encounter a stampede of bulls, there's no way to distract them. You just need to determine which way they're headed and get out of the way. Because bulls are not like horses. And they will not avoid you if you lie down. Your only way to be saved is to get out of the way and keep moving. Because the horn's kinetic momentum is deadly. My wife and I and my son Sam went to Spain. And it really opened my eyes to the running of the bulls. People get hurt when they run with bulls. The horn is the point of strength and catastrophic contact. The horn of a bull or ox is the strength to protect and save. Maybe we get a little idea with our car horn. You're getting into a situation, someone's veering towards you, you need extrication, you honk your horn because you want to widen things up, don't you? We honk when we want to be saved, when we want to be protected in what God is saying through Zechariah on this amazing naming ceremony day where a sign of circumcision is happening. Who is the horn that is coming? Who will extricate and make wide and wake up and awaken the awareness when that horn is coming? You're going to find this horn in the house of David. What does that mean? A king is coming. David was a king. David would have a son through the generations who would come. This house of David language is connected to a horn. Some of you have studied the book of Revelation. Whenever they reveal a great power... He's this beast with horns all over his head. Seven horns. It's kingly language. It's family language. Someone from the house of David, and he's speaking of Jesus Christ, will come. Jesus, the horn of salvation, would come in the flesh as that catastrophic contact from God to save I love what the astronaut James Irving uh, has has said. He said, The greatest miracle is not that a man has walked on the moon, but that God has walked upon the earth. Look at verse 71. This horn of salvation from the house of David is going to save us from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Our greatest enemies are not those who sin against us. Those are our enemies. Our greatest enemies are guilt shame, and death. A week ago, I visited a man who had COVID. And I had to tell him that his sister died. He was in his 70s, and he just wept. And I sat with him for 20 minutes. But this man, too, had COVID. And his sister had died of COVID. And I thought to myself, it's probably going to be another week, save a miracle. I prayed with this man. Friday of last week, I put that man into a body bag. And as I was doing it, I was so angry again at death. Death is an enemy. 
And for the first time in my career, I had to grab another body bag because you cannot send even a dead body to a funeral home without double bagging. I put a human being who had died into two bags because we are so worried that someone else could die from this dreaded disease. And as I sat there, I just said, Death, you are an enemy. You distance you distance this man who I cared for from me. And death, of course, distance us from God. Leon Morris said it best, New Testament scholar. The wrath of God's going to visit all men. And either we're going to die, or he's going to die. Look at verse 72. This coming of this horn of salvation is to show mercy, promise to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant. Tender mercy is brought up. Jesus is how the Father remembers his covenant. We don't use that language a lot. Covenant is a relational word. We talk about it like a covenant of marriage. All of reality is relational. The covenant is the nexus or link term that ties the whole narrative of the story of God together. A covenant, not a contract. A contract is when two mutually suspicious, risk-averse strangers enter into an agreement and opt out of almost anything that could cause a problem. The goal of a contract is to limit your liability. In a covenant, there is no opt-out clause because the person entering into it is saying, I am promising you a permanent promise. Jesus, the horn of salvation from the this, from this, uh, household of David, is the covenantal promise of God. But the Savior, Zechariah expresses, has a trailblazer. See, John, the son of Zechariah, O favored one, was going to be the trailblazer for the coming of this Savior. And John is going to bless his son at the naming ceremony. Look at verse 76. John, favored one, you're going to go before the Lord. You're going to prepare his ways. And here's what you're going to do, John. You're going to give knowledge of salvation, extrication, in the forgiveness of their sins. Forgiveness. The Greek word is radical. It means to release from a debt. And follow me here. Debt is not having no money. We've all been there. You're kind of living your life, you pay all your bills, and you go, I don't, know, I don't have a lot of money. Debt is the name for a nothingness that actually is something. Follow me here. Debt is actually the name for a nothingness that is actually something. Because it's not that you have no money, but you owe money relationally. This is a metaphor. You owe money relationally, and you cannot pay it back. Forgiveness. We have a natural revulsion to this grace of forgiveness. Sarah Silverman has a YouTube clip, which is very famous, where she says religion is just crazy. She's not a believer, and she does think religion is crazy. But she puts her um, focus on forgiveness. She says Christianity is crazy. You can just apologize if you're a sinner and you can go to heaven. If you're a murderer or you're Hitler who killed six million Jews, you can just go to heaven. Hitler goes to heaven. Hitler goes to heaven. She's trying to be a comedian, but she's saying out loud what so many of our cultures say because they don't understand how serious we need forgiveness. We naturally reject the grace of forgiveness. Mostly it's because we fear a final confrontation with our Creator. We think a final confrontation is just a fantasy. Many of our culture do. But really at base it's pride. Flannery O'Connor, the Southern writer, said, Grace must wound us before it heals us. We need to know that we, being born in Adam, have already brought onto the scene of our relationship with God a debt, and we've added to that debt. And we cannot extricate ourselves relationally. Forgiveness asserts that damage has been done. And Luke doesn't want to downplay or distract us from this forgiveness. He, he actually says that John is going to have to set up, even before Christ arrives, a pathway and to help people to try to open their minds to forgiveness. I think I saw forgiveness in one of the strongest ways when Rachel Den Hollander, the former gymnast and lawyer, the mother of three, 
who first accused the sports physician Larry Nassar of sexual abuse a year and a half, a, a, a while ago, she used in her sentencing recommendation, she actually said that she was going to forgive the very man that abused her. Some of you read her words. She offered him forgiveness, but insisted that he actually needed God's forgiveness far more, and that would require an understanding of the soul-crushing weight of his guilt. She said these words, as both a lawyer and as a Christian and as someone who experienced great harm. She said this, I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so you may someday experience true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me. Though I extend that to you as well. One thing that it says in this story is that the purpose of our extrication or salvation is that we can now serve God without fear. What a courageous thing for this woman to do. She is now fearless to say, you deserve the very wrath of God. And oh, how I hope you don't experience the soul-crushing weight of that guilt. You need his forgiveness far, for, far more than me, even though I extend it. The last point of this that we see in the naming ceremony is the shortest. It's this. You can actually experience spiritual extrication because of the sunrise. The sunrise of the Savior. Look at verse 78. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Zechariah was explaining how there's a group of people totally stuck in the darkness. They'd lost their way. They were in a situation that was going to lead to inevitable death, but then someone in that group spots on the horizon this little glimmer of dawn. Spiritual sunrises for those stuck in the darkness of death. Anyone sitting in the outgoing sunshine of that grace of God will have their guilt evaporated, their shame sun-dried, shriveled up, and sent away. The fear of death can be replaced by the very favor of God. This amazing story rounds the corner of darkness into brilliant, eye-squinting light because salvation always starts in the dark. And those of you that are really struggling right now, don't forget that. Salvation always starts in the dark. A seed's got to go into the ground. A baby has to spend time in the womb. Jesus must go to the cross. And remember, it was in the dark that he was cursed. It was in the dark that man, as our flesh, was cut off from the very human race so that life would come. What sign did they use to shame him? King of the Jews. Remember, the king was the horn. It was the powerful one. It was the contact that could save from the worst enemies. And he is being shamed. He was cut not with the horn of an animal, but with a whip, with a crown of thorns, with nails. Our creator, the God-man, would be cut away as a piece of sinful human flesh by his creations, creations of torment. A spear like a horn would be thrust into his side to verify his death. He wouldn't get two body bags. He would be tossed into a tomb, which was dark. But the sunrise must be preceded by the dark. Jesus in the tomb visited his people and had victory. In the beginning of the end of the world's long night began. Now, we're in 2020, 2,000 years later, and some of you will say, this was the darkest year I've experienced. COVID, work issues, church has been so crazy. But is the sunrise still happening? I love what E. Stanley Jones, the great missionary to India, said. He observed that the early Christians look out in their, looked out into their world. It was a frightening world. It was a collapsing world. But he noticed that they did not say what some of us are tempted to say in the darkness. They did not say in dismay, look what the world has come to. But Joan said, they said in delight, look what has come into the world. Jones continued, they did not see merely the ruin, but the resources for the reconstruction of that very ruin. They saw not merely that sin did abound, but that grace much more did abound. Where are you at? Look what the world has come to. Or look 
who has come into the world. The sunrise extricates us from hopelessness. And notice how it ends. The sunrise doesn't just come up as this blazing beauty, but it's to guide our feet onto the path of peace. A wide clearing. A peace. The danger of death and the threat of eternal distance from God is over. One of the reasons I became a nurse is I didn't want people to suffer. One of the reasons I entered into the ministry is I did not want people to eternally suffer. You today can have your feet guided onto the path of peace. You as a Christian who's already been saved can be reminded that peace is not just a feeling of exaggerated elation where all is expanded, but peace has a prince who is real, and he orders our lives. Peace is the knowledge. And would you believe it? Like Zechariah finally believed in the name of his boy? Would you believe that peace is the promise of eternal extrication from any problem you'll ever have with God? He will always favor you. I conclude with a troubling story with a sunrise ending. It was January the 24th, 2012, and Melissa Dome needed extrication. She was a high schooler, like many in a bad relationship with a guy, but he would not stop abusing her, and he would not stop calling her even after she broke up. And on January the 24th, he showed up at her home, and she could not escape being stabbed by him 32 times. She was left for dead. Two nearby teenagers, who she would call her angels, called 911. The first responder, Cameron Hill, shows up. He was an EMT firefighter, and he insisted, because of her damage, that she would not get through this unless she was airlifted. She would code four times at the hospital, receive 12 units of blood, and a nerve in her face was severed, so she would never have the beauty that she was born with. But she lived. And years later, when that boyfriend was sentenced to life in prison, Cameron Hill showed up and sat by her side. A little time later, she was invited to throw out the first baseball pitch at the Tampa Bay Rays game because she thought she did community service for those that experienced domestic violence. What she didn't know was that Cameron was going to be the man catching her ball. And on the ball, he wrote the words, Will you marry me? He got down on his knee. He looked up at her face, which had been ruined by someone else. And he said the words that were on that ball, Will you marry me? And then he took out a sign that signaled so much more. I covenant, if you will simply say yes to my favor, I covenant it to be in a relationship with you. I didn't come to extricate you. I came to love you. Extrication is not a technique. Oh, by the way, she said yes. <laughs> Extrication is not a technique. It is not something we do. It is only something that can be announced. It's about Jesus putting a ring on your finger and asking you to receive his favor for eternity. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm so glad that Luke the doctor wrote this story so that his friend would believe it with so much more certainty. Lord, we asked you before this that you would speak to each of us individually. I don't know what you decided to do here today, but I know that we have asked for your help, and you are the great one who saves us. Prepare our hearts now, Lord, for your supper. You did not just save us, but now you feed us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.